we are um, in an unusual edition and unexpected format uh, from for Soundbox September due to the global, global uh, pandemic. Uh, this year, most of the events are at local Soundbox uh, and global online events, about 50 throughout uh, the month. A month long celebration of uh, sound walking uh, by and for its community, crowdsourced, collaborative, and with a selection of curated events by us of Walk, Listen, Create, the organizer of uh, Soundwalk September. The people behind Walk, Listen, Create and Soundwalk September are Andrew Stuck, who came with the idea of a day long global celebration of sound walking to the main of walking encounters in France. Uh, two years ago, and now it grows to uh, 30 days of sound walking. Uh, Babak uh, Fakamzade is a digital artist and psychogeographer. He's the second uh, behind this uh, community and um, event. He um, and me, we um, are uh, welcoming you tonight. Uh, we have many wonderful events to um, offer to you to participate. Uh, we have two collective, collaborative actions to which you are invited. Shorelines, which is writing and reciting in places between land and water. And 30 days of walking, which is inviting you to record a walk on a day of your choice. And many programmed events of Soundwalk September, which I posted in the chat. You have a chat box. Um, at the window where you can check out uh, links that are posted. You are warmly invited to browse through our event menu and take part in our next um, curated talks, which will be introduced by Baba Kanantu. We have panels about virtual walks and outdoors uh, tomorrow. Uh, we have on Thursday a panel about remote, the unseen and walking. And Sunday I am back uh, as a moderator of a panel about walking encounters and communities uh, in the pandemic, focusing on the Prespes event in Greece at the Greek Albanian North Macedonian border, uh, where Jess arrived walking, um, uh, traveling to the whole of Albania, almost stumbling, but certainly a lot of stumbling upon. And uh, this event will be repeated next year and we are happy to talk about what is happening in between. Soundwalk September is made possible by the selfless dedication and great effort of many people, uh, many volunteers, without any structural funding or financial support. So if you like us, please help us uh, by participating in more events and as well by sharing uh, the events wherever you can in your social net networks. The curator of today is Jess Hastings. He's an artist using photography and stories to document his works and journeys. Coming from a deep sense and understanding of ecology, as well as environmental activism, he has worked in creative arts for over 40 years, interpreting and questioning place, ownership and landscape. His journeys are manifold and layered like the environment he occupies. We invited Jess to curate a group talk uh, tonight for Soundwalk September, for which he invited uh, four intriguing and eloquent speakers as himself, Alison Lloyd, uh, Michael Brandweit, Fiona Hesse, Trevor Smith, to present their work and for a conversation together with Jess and with you. Jess, thank you for doing this and it's up to you. Well, thank you very much for those kind words, Kit, and thank you to uh, Babek and to Andrew as well for, first of all, inviting me and putting your trust in me so that I'm not going to stumble too much this evening <laughs> and um, for setting all this Walk, Listen, Create thing up because it's actually very exciting and uh, it seems that we seem to be getting more and more people coming along and generating something very um, organic and useful to lots of different people. So thank you for that. 
Um, so this evening, I, I've chosen four quite different um, practitioners of, uh, of, of our sort of genre. Um, and uh, I'll go through them, I'll just briefly introduce them and then they'll talk, uh, they'll give a short introduction uh, about themselves and then we'll just get on with talking about their, their practice. So I've got first on the list there was there was uh, Michael Branswaite who um, is a, a sculptor, uh, a film and digital uh, a worker in, installer and works on installations. And um, a little bit of embarrassment uh, when, when you dig up all these things on the interweb. A long time ago in another life, he was a Saatchi Northern Star. <laughs> um, and he'll be talking about uh, finding Treblinka, which I think it, he and I have spent quite a lot of time talking about this, and it is really fascinating. Uh, and next is um, Fiona Hess from uh, Freiburg University. She's a researcher and curator and um, a one time actress, so I hear. <laughs> and um, she's just, uh, com uh, she's sort of claim to fame in a way is that she's done quite a lot of cura curatorial work, including at the Guggenheim in New York, and uh, recently completed her PhD on uh, Hamish Fulton, the walking artist. Trevor H. Smith, and it's really important that we must keep the H, this is, this is very important. I came, I stumbled across Trevor, I stumbled across Trevor. Um, when he was doing this really interesting project, Walks uh, with Other Artists, and I hope he's going to talk about that. I um, haven't found anything too embarrassing for him, uh, but he is a, a, an artist uh, specialising in the spoken word and drawing and freelance worker. He has got, though, some amazing wallpaper, if you notice, behind. And last but not least is Alison Lloyd, who's a walking artist um, and uh, is a trustee. So obviously very uh, honourable person uh, uh, with Primary. So if you haven't come across Primary, have a look. It's an artist-led organisation. Um, and uh, she specialises or has been specialising what, what attracted me to, it, to her work was this whole idea of contouring. And like Fiona, has recently completed um, uh, a PhD and sort of, uh, and just to big her up a bit, um, she's worked with many folks, including Jeremy Della, um, uh, Stephen Willits, uh, Maria, uh, Marina Abram Abramovich, to name a few. Okay, so um, to start off, so we'll have a quick chat about the artists and then um, a little bit about what they're doing, and then we'll sort of open up to the floor as, as it seems to be you know, quite <laughs> casual and organic these evenings go on. And then um, if, if, if we can get to sort of 8.30, 9 o'clock, that would be fine. If it goes a bit further than that, um, you may have to prod each other with a stick to keep each other awake, but I'm sure that will be fine. Okay, so Michael, um, would you like to just, hi, on you go. Thank yeah, you. okay. Um, I'm, I'll do a, a, a quick introduction for myself, and um, then I'm going to cover some points about the uh, Find Intrablinker project. I've got an image to show, and then I've got a bit of uh, text, just a paragraph to read out uh, from a, a paper where um, the total station, the particular artwork from Final uh, Finding Treblinka, was made. So. I think first of all, on the subject of stumbling or the, the notion of, of stumbling, um, it, it's been quite interesting because the for, for people who are just sort of uh, joining the, the, the panel had a very brief kind of uh, test run on Sunday and introduced a few ideas um, just to make sure everything was working. And, and since then I've become aware that just about every residency project that I do will involve stumbling, although it might not be the, the physical walking element of finding Treblinka. Um, I'm doing a, a, a virtual residency due to COVID with uh, Falstad Camp in Norway, where I'm stumbling 
through and around the internet, uh, finding various bits and pieces that are sort of uh, pertinent to that particular camp and the, the memorial centre there and what they're interested in doing. So, I think that's the first thing that the the notion of stumbling is something that kind of cuts across um, the the residency production part of my prac. Looks like Michael's just fallen off the end of the the universe there. Right. Well, we'll leave Michael for the moment, and we'll we'll go on to Fiona. Are you okay, Fiona? <laughs> So I'm very happy to be part of this talk tonight. Thanks a lot for inviting me, Jess. We met last year in Presbys, where I also met Gerd, and it was a wonderful experience. My first conference, actually, as a researcher, an official researcher of the University of Freiburg. And well, I'm art historian. I'm curator also for modern and contemporary art. And I have a special research interest on walking art, which came to my mind while writing my dissertation about the work of Hamish Fulton. And I'm very happy that I met so many interesting and fascinating artists who have walking as their artistic practice and expanding towards and floating and stumbling about other kind of artistic practices which come along. And I'm very happy that we continue talking about art and walking art especially. That's, that's from my side. I'm actually curious what you discovered in the interweb about my acting career, my former. <laughs> Long time that's ago. Another, that's so. another story in a long time ago. Exactly. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks, Fiona. I'm sure you'll be able to sort of input on the research side as we continue. Um, Trevor, are you okay for for kicking off now? I'm okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, walking is uh, in my work because, and it's only been in my work for about two years as an artist anyway. And it's in there because I wanted to see if I could be a walking artist. Um, I didn't really know what it meant. There's a lot of artists that walk who I admire, uh, Hamish Fulton for one, but um, I, I desperately so I did a three year MA part time, which finished this year. And I'd say I've spent the entirety of the last two years of it trying to crowbar uh, walking into my artistic practice. And that's where the stumbling in stumbling comes in for me because I've stumbled on something else uh, through my project walks with other artists, which I guess we'll talk about uh, later on. But I think that's my introduction. Great, thank you very much. And <laughs> last but not least, by any means, Alison. Hello, hello everyone, um, and thank you. Um, Jeremy for inviting me to be part of this uh, discussion. Um, I guess I stumbled into this um, walking and art um, because I was made redundant from the Arts Council in 2010 and I was amongst a, a group of um, managers um, at the East Midlands office. None of the others wanted to leave, but I thought redundancy was probably a, a good opportunity to uh, revisit to re revisit an artistic my artistic work from the 1970s, and um, I kind of wrote. My boss asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, "I want to bring contemporary art and walking together." And at that point. Really, I only knew about Richard Long and Hamish Fulton and Marina Abramovich and um, a few a few other others. Um, and uh, so I, I guess that's my me stumbling into it, um, not really fully un understanding at that point that there are in fact hundreds 
of artists who involve walking in, in some way in their in their work and their practice. Um, I'd been doing a lot of um, hill walking and mountaineering, and I guess it was that amateur passion that um, that becoming more of a, an experienced hill walker and the more experienced a hill walker I was thinking about how I could work with contemporary art and I, to begin with I, I, I thought as a curator I thought as a mediator and I brought other artists with me to walk with me rather than recognizing that perhaps I could be an artist and eventually I began to accept that I was an artist after about a year or two um, and began to um, kind of find a way in which I could bring my hill walking and my navigation skills, hence the contouring, into, an art, um, into my methods and processes as an artist. And as I was doing this, because I'd been aware of Richard Long and Hamish Fulton, I also decided I was going to look for the women equivalents from the 60s and 70s. So basically my PhD is about looking at the women equivalents um, or a few of the women equivalents from the 60s and 70s. Uh, women who were not actually categorized as walking artists, um, unlike Hamish Fulton and Richard Long, who well, certainly Hamish Fulton in particular was definitely categorizing himself as a walking artist. I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Alison. That's great. That's a really good introduction. And um, we'll go back to Michael. Michael Blanthwaite. Are you good? No. Um, so yeah, the Find and Treblinka project. Um, I was invited to go by a, a group called IC Access, who were working. Um, Pan-European on Europe's traumatic history. I'd, I'd already actually worked with one of the principal investigators, Professor Caroline Sturdy Coles, on an exhibition at the Treblinka Museum. So I was aware of the site, but I'd never actually explored the site. I, I'd sort of um, seen some information. I, I'd made an artwork in response to that in conversation with Caroline, and then I'd gone and installed the work, and then th this later uh, project which involved uh, people from all kinds of different disciplines was, was obviously on the same site, but approaching it in a different way. Um, so because I knew there was going to be such a breadth of activity happening in the three days that I was there, from conferences inside, so a very clean environment, um, talking about quite sort of uh, theoretical, philosophical sort of uh, aspects of memory and memorialization, as well as budgets and you know where where the budget should be shared and, and, and more uh, pragmatic sort of uh, concerns, and then outside in the field, as it were, there was a team from Staffordshire University where I also work, and they were using uh, uh, equipment called Total Station to map and plot out the uh, the site and where they thought buildings were in the site. So essentially, cre creating a a map through the area. Um, which got really interesting because it kind of intersected roads, open fields, and um, sort of clusters of trees. So it was sort of building a, a landscape or, a, or almost a concept or an idea of a landscape on top of what was actually existing there now. Uh, so my response to that was just to take a digital SLR camera um, and to photograph and film. So I knew that's how I was going to be recording, as, as well as a sketchbook, of course, uh, and a notepad. So when I got there, I, I literally stumbled uh, and set myself different ways to move around the site. So that there's the um, the visitor maps of where all the different parts of the site are. So there's, there's a labour camp, there's a quarry, and, and various other sort of. Obviously, it's a very traumatic site, so. Execution areas, suspected mass graves, and, and various other things. Um, so I was kind of a bit like the situationist. I was just sort of drawing a line from one one place to the other, uh, and, and trying to navigate that in, in an attempt to just have a completely different encounter with the site compared to the um, 
the I guess the narrative that try um, the, the the narrative that the memorialization tries to put across because because obviously that's from a very particular place uh, and a set of very particular ideas. But also quite interesting to note is that that's completely changed now. So the uh, it was under Treblinka was under the um, control of the regional government. Now it's un, under control of the national government. So they're actually changing all their displays to um, to fit a new narrative. So that 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 kind of come um, solidified in my mind that there was definitely something quite interesting about stumbling, but also about exploring how narratives are constructed and how encountering things and the way in which you encounter things might sort of build stories and narratives. So just briefly, this artwork is some of the things I encountered as I went around the site. Um, so there's something quite poetic about this uh, beetle struggling in a puddle, um, which I have to admit, I did help it out the puddle after I filmed it. Um, it didn't feel right to, to leave it there. Uh, as well as on the right, you have the um, the forensic archaeologist using this total station equipment to take these very accurate points uh, from the site, and that's what the red dots uh, across the screen are. These are these mapping out points where there's suspected um, undulations in the earth, and then the backdrop is actually a lidar scan, so that um, works on um, topography, so it's not. Um, you wouldn't see trees so much or buildings and that, but you would see undul undulations. And uh, most importantly for the forensic archaeologists, archaeologists, any sort of dips in the ground where they might have been disturbed a long time ago, that's quite hard to spot from the surface. Um, so I'm just going to read out this uh, paragraph. Um, the Total Station, that's the title of the work. Total Station was developed at Treblinka during an IC access project workshop. It utilizes video and split screen editing to create a moving collage where the artist, see myself, controls the flow of images pertaining to the site. In this case, the notion of investigation and discovery in discovering a site is alluded to by the airborne LIDAR data that pans from top to bottom as a backdrop, offering an aerial and topographic view of the region in which Treblinka is located. This work, along with several others developed by Branthwaite, highlights the paradoxical juxtaposition of beauty and horror at a Holocaust site. Many camps and killing sites were situated within tranquil, remote fields and forests that ultimately became scarred by the events that took place therein. Whilst, as Polyphate argues, in the first place the Holocaust was a human catastrophe and evil committed against humanity, not against nature, for the crimes to be perpetrated, the landscape had to be changed. Nature also became a coincidental yet passive witness to human acts of violence, both a, metaphoric, both a metaphorical and physical sense. Vegetation, for example, may become a living memorial, or an indicator of the presence of buried remains in a forensic sense. The work alludes to the fact that within the modern landscape, nature has all but recovered, even if people have not. That's great. Thanks, Michael. That that really sort of gives us a good uh, starting point uh, on your stumbling about um, and and how you work as well. Um, Fiona, let's hear about your stumbling, please. Well, in a way, I think research is like traveling through information on one hand and stumbling about information as well. So it's a constant mixture for me between I have a I have a place to go, I have an aim, and I have a path to follow, and then I get information, and then I get off the track, and I stumble upon new information, and I get lost, and then I come back. So in a way, my whole work as an art historian can be kind of walking and stumbling as well. Mm. It's nevertheless interesting when I research about walking art, it does change my perception of walking myself. So when I walk through nature, when I walk through urban spaces, my perceptions uh, changed also because I interacted in walking practices, walking encounters, public walks, which of 
in a way also made my focus change on how I look at things, how I look in my environment. And I really like the fact that a lot of walking artists have the environment in mind, not only nature and itself, but also how we treat nature, how we interact with people in nature or also in in cities and in urban spaces. So when I do go hiking or walking and I do stumble, literally it's always interesting because it can again change the focus and the perception of things I was thinking about and make me come back to the recent moment. And it's for me always interesting to inter intertwine these things also in my research. And I think uh, the research, for example, for Treblinka, it's it's fascinating and in a way horrifying what you find then while traveling there and stumbling upon all those uh, lost histories and lives. Thank you, Fiona. That was, that was great. I, I, I like the, um, the, the idea uh, of the, re the, the, the recent moment which uh, I think we could sort of pull about, pull a, pull apart a bit a, a bit later on. But um, talking of recent moments, uh, if you're okay with that, we'll move over on to Trevor. I think the stumbling part of um, my practice is the, the the reason that it's relevant for this is that um, I am um, having previously. I've just finished my MA, which was three years, and before that, I was making a lot of text-based work. Some of it was three-dimensional, some of it was um, uh, billboards or business cards and things like that. And um, when I started my MA, um, I had the idea that I would somehow get back, find a way back to making physical work. Um, as it happens, the first three things that I made on my MA were even less... Um, tangible they were spoken word pieces um but by the end of the first year um i had planned to walk the pennine way which is a 268 mile uh, national trail from derbyshire up to scotland and uh, there's all sorts of personal reasons why i did that but i also decided that because i i had spent the last sort of three years looking at residencies and not really fitting with any of them because i had two very young children um, a couple of part-time jobs and this so I thought I, I would call it my own residency so I became the unsolicited artist in residence on the Pennine Way National Trail and the idea of that was that it would somehow um, inspire new work and I've never worked like that before um, all through my undergraduate years and then the sort of five years between that and my MA I um, just sort of I hadn't really identified a way of working. I thought that things were just springing out of my head. Obviously, they weren't. I was processing the world around me and responding to it. But I had never deliberately put in a sort of stimulus to make work. So I declared myself as the resident on the Pennine Way. Uh, I went there with my oldest friend, a friend of like 20 years. And um, during the Pen Aim Way, I took a few small short films I made. I was far too tired to actually write a physical diary, um, which I realized on the first night. It was, felt much more appropriate to write it out on social media and post it that way and talk about it that way. Um, anyway, the upshot of it was that by the end of the 17 days, which we had been hiking together, although I had made some films, I, did a, I made a book of, um, can you see that? I didn't figure out how to share my screen, but I made a book of these just really sort of fine sort of horizon horizon drawings. Um, I did some more spoken word stuff. But really, the thing from the Pennine Way that I, from the residency, shall we say, that I wanted to get into my practice was the walk in itself. And it was the privilege of being to spend so much time alone with one other person um, that I felt 
most needed to be shared. Um, so I've devised this project. Uh, I should say my friend Derek is, he's a mathematician and I'm an artist. And when we were on our walk, um, I told him that I had this talk planned for afterwards and I was going to talk about my experience as a walking artist, even though I didn't really know what that was. And uh, his response was, well, what's the difference between an artist that walks and a mathematician that walks? And he said, and he said that while sort of marching off over the hill, you know, trying to get to where he needed to be. And I said, um, I'd rather not answer that right now because <laughs> I didn't have the answer. Um, so, so I came up with this project, which was I would go for walks with other artists, one at a time for a day at a time, um, with the conversation set around that question. Uh, what's the difference when an artist goes for a walk compared to when a, a, a non, someone who doesn't identify as an artist goes for a walk? And um, it, it quickly stumbled into something else altogether. Most of us, I mean, we all had a little go at sort of, well, maybe the artist uh, makes connections that, that non-artists don't see, but I, I'm not entirely sure that that's true. I think some people make connections and some people don't. Probably most of the ones that do become artists or more of the ones that do become artists. Um, it's just as likely that an artist might go for a walk and just be desperate to get back to the studio or, or, or that you know someone who works in an office might uh, notice little little things on the way to their office every day that if, if they weren't in that office, they might be making work about that. So we, I quickly concluded that there wasn't really any difference between an artist walking and a non-artist walking. And um, what happened next was that um, the, the walks became, they became part sort of uh, art, a, a practice critique where we talked about what their work was. Um, they became a sort of really uh, quiet, slow sort of networking where I got to meet these people that I had only known online or whatever. Um, but the biggest thing was that they became a sort of um, a sort of group therapy. I think we didn't just talk about art for like seven hours walking through the hills. When you walk with someone side by side for seven hours or whatever, you know, there's there's little eye contact, and I think that opens people up. And then there's this thing about moving through the landscape that opens up as well. And so it became something like that. Um, it's it became about that really, and then. All of the while, whilst doing this, I was doing my MA and desperately trying to find a way to present this as work. And I think, well, I handed in my thesis just over the summer, and the conclusion was that it's not. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually something that supports the work. Um, but I think that's, it's a really important thing, and I hope to do more of it. Thanks, Trevor. That's that's really great. Lovely. And uh, Alison, please. I'm just wondering where to start because there's some really good points that Trevor made there about where he decided that what he did was supported the art rather than and was the art. Mm. Um, and of course, in my thesis, um, I'm looking at uh, three women artists, uh, Nancy Holt, Michelle Stewart and Mary Yates. None of whom, well, Nancy Holt, I couldn't talk to. She had unfortunately already died. Um, Mary Yates was really skeptical that walking had anything to do with her work. And Michelle Stewart was really interested and curious that uh, walking was an aspect of her work, but and immediately said, yes, walking was very, really important to her. Because as Trevor says, walking being important doesn't necessarily mean that you are a walking artist um but throughout my thesis i kind of the reason i mentioned this this trevor is because um i made the case that these women all were walking were not necessarily walking i wouldn't necessarily call them a walking artist but that they were very definitely walking was an, imper an imperative was was a, a really um not just a supporter of their work was actually very much um embedded in their work and flowed through their work and that without the walking or the, as we understand it nowadays as walk um as a sort of method genre process or whatever you want to call it um you know that there was significant impact on their 
on their work. And I guess I could probably take your work, Trevor, and do the same thing. Um, in terms of my work and stumbling, um, so I arrived with on this there was this idea of bringing contemporary art and hill walking together. And at that time, around about 2010, there was the 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 Walking Artists Network was was beginning and and was having meetings and um and what was fantastic about the Walking Artists Network was incredibly um open um, egalitarian. You know, you didn't have to be known to to be part of it. You could be Alison from Nottingham. Going and going down to an event in London that was part of the Walking Artist Network, and they were offering 50 quid bursaries to go, so I could afford to go. And at that discussion, you know, we all brought our kind of discussion and ideas together. I described micro navigation because this was something that I'd been learning um, as a hill walker and mountaineer, um, where you literally navigate every sort of 300 meters 500 meters it's very useful if you're on the Pennine way in certain parts because you really do need to know where you are at any given point in certain parts of the Pennine way i mean i know other parts are like motor the motorway but there are there are certain bits where the path disappears and i was really fascinated by stumbling and walking where there weren't paths um and this is where the contouring came in. So when you do the micro navigation, you actually navigate via the map and the compass to sort of little kinks, tiny kinks, I mean, in, in, a, in a contour. Um, and you kind of get into the zone and, and very much um, uh, mathematics, I guess, geometry become really important. And so it was that contouring, that focusing on the ring, Oh, then that micro navigation then took me to the ring contours and then took me to sort of identifying five square kilometers within the dark peak where there were definitely was no regular footpaths um and probably i wanted to it was also an area that sorry i'm rambling a bit here it it, it was also an area that um where i could um uh, revisit time and again, but at different sections of it. Um, all of these kind of give you some idea. I probably ought to, um, when you've seen these, I'll show you something that I did in the 1970s as to why I'm always emphasizing my sol being solo and solitary and remote because you can see the. Um, the cable release between from hand to camera. Mm. So I'm always taking my own imagery. And then you can see the sort of peat. Um, in this particular one, you can see a, a grouse um, butt. So, so on the one hand, there's this micro navigation, this walk, walking on my own, this hill walking. But then there's also I've got a picture on the wall here, which again I guess is about. Can you will you be able to see this? Mm -hmm. Which is about falling, swinging, kind of movement. So, so I guess there is a performative movement side of things to what I do. Which, I, which I'm drawing on from my work in the 1970s. And maybe it was because I felt that I had to, if I was going to return to a practice after, you know, after a 40 year break, then I needed to investigate kind of what it is that I had been doing back in the 70s. And, and you see, because I've got a tiny screen, I can't see whether you can see that. Yeah, okay. we can see that. It's, it's good. It's good. Okay, fine. Right, I'm going to stop there. Okay. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Alison. So um, 
before, before I sort of open it to the floor, I just sort of recap, recap um, that, you know, that this whole idea that these, these four very different artists and researcher um, have, you know, rely on different methods and processes and the philosophy and the memory um, and in the field um, and different encounters and situations uh, and the one thing that kept on coming up was the sort of the nature and the landscape which seems to be something that comes up quite a lot in these conversations um, on walk listen create um, and then the recent moment uh, and the, the the practical side of techniques um, and the the uh, suggestion of what the art is all about right down to the very you know what Alison was talking about in the same way that Michael was talking about in a different way of this micro navigation you know Michael was using highly technical things to find micro bits of information and Alison was using a very practical side of compass and a map and um, quite old skills to, to do this micro navigation um, thumbing your map uh, where there are no paths and I think that's for all of us that's quite a, a key aspect of it, which you stumble because there are no paths. Um, and uh, it, it, it is at that time quite, quite solitary um, uh, and, and presumably we just feel remote. So um, I hope that's, that sort of sums you all up. Um, please feel free to uh, write any complaints on the back of a postage stamp uh, later on. Okay, that would be great. Um, so, is anybody, would anybody like to make any comments about that uh, to our, our panel or, um, yeah, just... I have a question, yeah. It? Yeah, but, yeah, but, Babek, I... Thanks, um, and thanks guys, um, um, it was um, nice to listen to. I have a question uh, specifically directly for Michael. Uh, in relation to um, the project that you highlighted, Finding Treblinka, you mentioned um, um, at some point the mix of beauty and horror that you um, um, yeah, encountered is maybe not the right word, but that you described the, the mix of beauty and horror. Uh, and although, of course, this beauty is something that is uh, current and the horror is something that's from the past, um, but the mix is very apt. Um, because of course it is, uh, these, these camps are set in, uh, they were set in very beautiful surroundings. Anyway, um, the obvious parallel, the thing is with Treblinka, this happened 70, almost 80 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, the obvious parallels with today of Treblinka and other concentration and destruction camps from Nazi era Germany uh, are with today's refugee camps, the way we as society treat refugees and um, in, in Europe particularly, but not just in Europe, uh, it's many other places around the world where refugees are really badly treated. And um, maybe more specifically, the way in which uh, asylum seekers in the United States are treated by ICE. Now, uh, do, are you able to say something about these parallels between today and uh, what you yourself encountered in Treblinka and how maybe the past, this past, reflects on the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first thing I think to address is the the sort of um, the motivating factor for myself to actually take these projects on, um, and it, it's really about, um, if I'm totally truthful, a, a fear that um, of, of what a human can do or, or, or what a human can can think is okay. Um, it's a really great quote by um, uh, Primo Levi about you know it's it doesn't feel evil to shut a door to flick a switch to um, you know to do mundane tasks but actually the 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 net result of all those quite mundane things is uh, is something um, far worse. Uh, so, so yeah, the first thing I would comment on is one of the motivating factors for me is that that this is a history that keeps repeating, um, and so I think going and looking for it. And um, the sort of how, how it manifests in con the contemporary mind is is, is really important to, to me, and, and that's why um, 
I think it's interesting to re-encounter these sites, not from a historical narrative, but from um, almost a clean uh, slate. So you you stumble through them, you kind of, um, if you like, reinvent the encounter. Um, so that, and, and then that composite artwork was kind of trying to grasp the, the very um, multifaceted nature of the, the conversations, the evidence, the rethinking that goes on. Um, Relating to the refugee camps, I think the the thing with them and with the Holocaust, particularly the revision, re, revisionism, um, that's quite prevalent on the internet at the moment. Um, I mean, it was prevalent anywhere, but it, it, it's given it a platform where it's it, it's kind of accelerated. There's a fluidity to those arguments than, more than there was previously. Uh, and, and it's kind of the fact that the, the revisionism is looking for some kind of justification um, or, or some kind of excuse that makes certain things allowable and acceptable. Uh, and, and then that's when I come to the refugee camps where, where I think there's a lot of um, a lot of press, a lot of discussions, you know, certainly in the UK, we hear it every day, we, we hear kind of um, words being used that really don't describe what we're seeing. So. Um, you know, only this morning there was there was a boat with sixteen p potential refugees managed to land at Dover, and apparently that's an invasion. Um, the you know the press's words, not not my words. Uh, and and I think that kind of terminology of calling it an invasion is actually the start of the desensitisation that that we're not dealing with people anymore. We're dealing with a thing called a refugee. And and so that's you know that's where I think this this thing comes full circle for me, and and where a lot of um, the the evidence of the Holocaust and and, and yeah I, yeah sorry I've, I've <laughs> gone off track a little bit there you know the the, the reason why it, it should not go away from our contemporary minds is that we we can see the parallels um, playing out all the time. I'm speaking from the UK in particular and the media. Um, I actually spend a lot of time in Croatia as well, where my, my wife is um, from, uh, and you know also see sort of various um, things being discussed and this gradual, what I would call a creeping language, and and the language changes, and then then anybody coming on a boat is a, is an invader. So that's an invasion. Then you've got invaders, and then you've got the other. And, and then the other is a problem. Well, it's not a problem for me, but if you, if you see what I mean, it, it creates a problem, and then yeah, so things escalate. So I don't, I don't know if I got anywhere near what you were trying to probe there, but no. no I was just asking uh, for <laughs> your uh, input, right, uh, to uh, to uh, to create this parallel between uh, the past eight years ago mm -hmm. and today. And the, the reason uh, why I was interested is um, the following. Uh, I think the primary reason why um, we as a species uh, or you know, in Europe particularly uh, slide down into this behavior which uh, might result in us as uh, European, a European nation to repeat the problems, the same problems of the past is because the events of um, eight years ago ha are passing from living memory, right? Yeah. Um, so because you know after the second world war uh, everyone knew of what happened during the war and many people had first person experience um and then uh, one two generations later um people had second hand experience but now we are losing even the second hand experience people yeah. almost no one is still alive that uh, experienced um uh the second world the atrocities of the second world war or uh, in Europe of war um, uh, and also the secondhand accounts are disappearing so no one's no one is starting to know anyone who knew someone who knew yeah. who experienced this personally and uh, but one of the things that of course you do uh, you as an artist in relation to uh, finding uh, creating a work like finding Treblinka is to you know, keep the memory alive or something to uh, to keep on making people aware of the atrocities of the past but that you know does does it work? Maybe it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, 
I mean, I've, yeah, I've, there's sort of um, there's there's many questions on that. Um, I mean, the feedback from the exhibitions has has been kind of um, yeah, I'm not going to say positive because I think that you know that would just be an outright lie. But the uh, when it was at the Wiener Library, the uh, Wiener Library for Holocaust Studies in London, that the exhibition went there, um, and the they had done quite a comprehensive. Uh, visitor feedback, so you know they really probed the visitors and asked, they didn't just say do you like it or not. They were kind of how do you know anything more about the Holocaust after seeing this? Um, did the artworks make you think of anything in a different way? What what was it? So it was it was really quite a good evaluation. In fact, so good that I, I borrowed quite a bit of it. Um, uh, but but I think the point is is that the the reactions that the audience were having was kind of quite in line with what I was thinking. So so there was quite a bit of, um, obviously there's the shock of the events uh, in finding out those truths, but it's also thinking about how um, everything, even ourselves, construct the, the history that leads from us back to those events. Um, it's quite an interesting term kind of bounded around since, if, if I remember correctly, about 2013 called a prosthetic memory. And th that kind of fits into what you were mentioning about um, the, it, the, uh, the, the passing of living memory. And now effectively we have a prosthetic memory that we've assembled from the bits of evidence we found. And I think where artists can come in is in kind of making artworks that challenge and direct and make people think about that evidence that they're assembling and how they're assembling it. So we, we all um, assemble a truth and a history or, or an idea of it. And a, and a lot of the work that I'm interested in sort of deals with the sort of slightly nefarious way that that happens and the sort of slippages um, and the, the jumps we make in our imagination between different points. Um, so, so I think there is, I think there is a role for art in, in that. Um, and I think certainly as museums move more digital, um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm speaking on a panel tonight, but I'm, I'm, I'm going along with some other panels in the next week or two, um, mainly about digitizing memorial sites and what that actually means and, and how how those memories that are being recorded um, are, are now, you know, now need structured in a way where um, the, the youth, if you like, the, the younger generation can understand the Holocaust and, and the responsibility that, that we have to make sure that they approach that with an open mind and, and sort of build kind of um, well, it's difficult because you you kind of want people to to mount a challenge and not just accept one particular narrative, but by doing that, you you open the floodgates to other other potential um, interpretations. Yeah, and a risk of trivialization. I don't want to uh, monopolize yeah. the discussion, but I'm going to mention one brief thing that you might be aware of is uh, one TikTok filter. I think that allows you to make yourself look like a, a concentration camp survivor. Um, yeah. Which, of course, makes <laughs> the Holocaust very accessible, but not in a very nice way. Um, yeah. So, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a Robert. OK. Now, I developed in the 60s onwards what I call art walks, where art replaces life. Over the decades, I've extended it, and now I can make it fill the whole day, which I call art days. I'm good at doing it for myself, but if I bring others in, they have to do exactly what I say, or it becomes them, and I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I'm just wondering how that fits in with Art Walks, because this is a totally new concept. I'm coming at a, a, the existential concept as a performance yeah. artist. Well, Trevor. I think you, you may, Trevor and uh, Alison may like to input, and then Fiona can ask the next question. But I think that's a really important issue there, Robert. Thanks for bringing it up. So what, what, what we we saying that it's not the same thing that you when you do it on your own, it has different meaning to when you do it with someone else. No, which makes sense. It's an extend. It's an extension of the same thing. But when other people start taking over, they don't do exactly what I say. Then it becomes a new thing, and it doesn't have anything to do with me because it becomes about them. 
because it's what they do. So art yes. days are like a, a, a projection of your own psyche on the rest of the world. Right. Well, I think you're right, but I, I think with the way that that what you've just described is 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 what I do, but I do it deliberately because I don't want to do it on my own. <laughs> I think that I I would rather let someone else choose the location. The I mean, I, I, obviously, I dictate a couple of the topics of conversation, but I feel I feel more comfortable. Um, putting it in the other person's hands and in a sense in a sense it's um this is the my original rationale for why i thought that my walks with other artists was the work was because the walk was the thing that i was giving to the other person and i was giving them permission um to take a day out of their life and dictate this walk and and just relax and forget about everything else and all that but yeah, anyway, that's that's another thing. But I, I couldn't find a way to make that the leap from the walk itself to presenting that to the world without just telling people what I had done. And to me, that's that, that just wasn't quite enough. When I started this journey of um, returning to a practice, um, I think I wasn't confident, but probably wasn't entirely confident enough to work with others. I needed to kind of find my own feet, you know, and kind of uh, um, you know work work on my own. Um, you know, it was almost like I needed time to uh, find my language, you know, re re refine the language that I was familiar with or not familiar with. But I have to say that as time's gone on. Um, particularly during um, the current pandemic, I desperately wanted to walk with other people. Um, and so I have been walking with other people um, and enjoying walking with other people and turning the camera on other people, you know, my friends, instead of me. So I've been kind of going to a piece of wasteland that's about 900 metres from my front door um, and inviting people along. and. To enjoy the place and um, and then enjoying and photographing them in 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 this site um, and and that is in some ways is contributing to the work that I do. I mean, I yeah. Great, Robert. You, you want to when it's about if you define an artist as I've got two people inside me. One person which pays the rent, uh, puts clothes on, looks fine. And uh, is moral. The artist is this anarchic, amoral self. But the me person, the bit of it, it's in control of the other. It doesn't get out of hand. I hold it, it tamed down. Now, this me, my what day walk is uh, uh, living out of this in, inside person, giving it free reign, but within a well-defined mode. Now, I would call, I would call this art. And what I would call you, what I would call you, is spiritual, um, as opposed to art. And spiritual, i.e., as encompassing everything. In art, you can't because I've got this ego holding what is within me. But if it's spiritual, it's bigger than me. So when you open up to everything like you do, and let other people then take from that everything and become them as, themselves as everything as part of your concept, I would see it. Not so much as a, 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 a creative act, but artistic act, but as a spiritual act, which is even bigger. Uh, that's a very good way of putting it, and I hadn't used that word, um, but I I have described it as a sort of form of therapy. Um, and I think what you've what you've um, highlighted there is the um, the reason why I couldn't. And I mean, not just me, my whole MA cohort couldn't figure out how this was art or where it was. Um, everyone wanted to do it. Everyone wanted to come for a walk, but nobody nobody had an answer. And I tried so many things, you know, ways of presenting it. But however you present it, it loses the thing itself. Or well, Hamish Fulton said that um, not no work of art can represent the walk. It's just a separate thing that's describing it. And 
yeah, I, that's just difficulty that I came up against, but particularly because I think I can see Fiona with her hand up, particularly, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. but particularly Robert, because um, I, I was, I think I was just trying too hard. I desperately wanted all of it to be the work, but you know, it's not. And that's why it, 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 I sort of resolved it as something that supports my practice, although it's probably the biggest factor. Anyway, well, I'll leave I it there for you and I can go. I would, just coming quickly, I would call that the spiritual, i.e. something bigger than us that's in control of us, rather than me as an artist in control of what I put down. So you're letting into a bigger power that you don't know, whereas I'm controlling something I know very well. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, Fiona, your hand was... Yes. I really like that conversation and I really like this topic of spiritual and ego. In a way, the the more important the ego of the artist, the more important that the people who walk with you or who um, take part in the walk get as close as possible to the experience you as an artist may want them to have or may have had yourself. In a way, but on the other hand, the participant could also be more spiritual and step back from their ego to represent themselves within this walking art situation and let the artist's idea sink in and get into get into this mode of um, guided walk, like for example Hamish Fulton does, but also other artists like last year in Prespice. So when you open up to an idea, this is very interesting. And, and, and I have this, uh, this question from other people. Why should be walking? Why should walking be art constantly? When I talk about my research, like, oh, walking can be art. So when I walk from A to B, when I walk to the sink over there or the table, so that's art or what? So they, uh, when, and they say, yeah, well, no, <laughs> not directly. It's a little bit more uh, diverse this whole practice, but I think it's it's a uh, very important very important to talk about when walking becomes art, because from my side, of course, as a researcher and art historian, because. Uh, yeah, it's scientific research, so it has to be like structured. But also, walking as an artistic practice is so diverse. It, walking itself can be art. You just walk seven seven steps, and this can be art. Or you take walking as an artistic practice within your artwork or within your other artistic practices like you walk somewhere and then you paint or you have sound walks you collect things or you take photographs or stuff like that so it can be so diverse and i think this is difficult for people to understand sometimes but can i, I have fiona to... that begs the question when does walking become art well as from my scientific point of art uh, of view and research, I would say if it's different from everyday walking at first, it should be in a way different. Um, even if it's just in your head as an artist, you it's it's the attitude you approach walking. The the first step you take within your walking art practice uh, would ideally be part of a, of an artwork already not just unconsciously walk and then afterwards say, oh, that was art. Um, I like the thought of pre-thinking of a kind of concept behind your walking. If, if you say, okay, I'm an artist and I now start walking and trying to find a new artistic practice and then you say, I did this walk as an artist already this walk can be part of your artistic practice and become walking art. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. uh, in a way, you, it's it's fluent. Some artists are very strict 
and they say, okay, if if you're not walking, uh, like Hamish Fulton, he's very strict. He says, um, my artwork is just about walking. If I didn't take a walk beforehand, whatever I do and create cannot be, cannot turn into a piece of art. Other other artists are not that strict. They just say, well, I'm an artist and I walk, so why couldn't this walk I take the artist? But I like the thought that it can be different from every day. If you walk every day to your work and one day you decide, okay, this might be a piece of art, it should be different from, yeah, it's, do you know what I mean? Yes. Well, Fiona, we, we have had this conversation and it came up a lot in uh, Presbys, if you remember mm -hmm. it. Um, and I sort of come back to this whole idea of intentionality, you know, mm -hmm. because if you, you know, I do a lot of walking, I don't really drive much. So I walk to the shops and I walk the dog and I walk, you know, around the garden and I walk around the park. But those are not pieces of art, you know, the art that I do is intentional from A to B or C to A or mm -hmm. along a particular route or whatever, which is then becomes its own own piece itself. Um, David, you had a, you put your hand up, was that? What? I, I think it's when you're in the zone really and when you're grounded. It's really, I mean, I know it's a cliche term, but but when you're feeling at one, and I think that was quite interesting with Robert and Trevor's. They're two different things, and yet they're the same, in that you're in the zone, and and it, and they're both very powerful in that. And I think I think you are grounded, and you and I think your walk to the shops can be an art. I, I don't think you're right, but I think uh, on a bad day it isn't. But on a you know when you're in the zone, it can. Why can't it be? And you, you're, I know, I, yeah, that's all, just in the zone. Okay, okay. I, can, I can mute myself now. <laughs> that, thank you, David. Uh, Viv, did you want to say something about it? Because I know that you're... Yeah, well, I mean, I agree that intentionality is obviously one part of it. You know, for me, uh, my work is actually based on everyday walks. You know, uh, what I'm interested in is other people's everyday walks. So going to the shop and uh, and all that stuff is, you know, manna to me. That's um, that's perfect. Um, I don't really worry about what, what I do, whether it's art, it might be music, it might just be me walking. Um, but I certainly uh, like Trevor, you know, I like to walk with people um, even more than Trevor. I let them dictate where we walk. You know, I'm interested I, my project Shadow Walks. Um, other people are taking me on walks that mean something to them, probably just because it's the everyday walk to the news agent. That's why it might mean something or it might be something more profound. And that doesn't worry me at all. Um, and I guess in a way I'm a collector because I record what they say on the walk, but I don't direct the conversation in any way except just to say, where are we and why did you choose the walk? And that's usually all that's, that's needed. Because as Trevor said, when you're walking side by side, even if you've only just met the person that minute, there's masses that they tell you, you know, they tell you all kinds of uh, quite intimate <laughs> things about themselves, you know, just because that's how walking is. And then, of course, I, I make um, a sound work out of that. So there is like a an object at the end. So I'm a kind of a, you know, I have, I support what everybody says in a way. I don't use the word spiritual. It makes me uncomfortable. Um, and I'm not so, as I say, I'm not so worried about the word art either. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Kit, Kit, you 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 put your hand up. Uh, indeed, I would like to add to this uh, with with my personal practice, which is about getting lost in a very broad sense, uh, and uh, the the fact of chance actually, as I perform together with a Puerto Rican dancer, um, uh, in the sense that we have made arrangements uh, that we will only perform together, walk together actually. Uh, when we are in the same city at the same time, but without knowing in advance that we will be there or that we are there. 
so um, uh, actually this seems to be very random, uh, but it happened already six times that we were at the same city. She has a very uh, traveling life as I have as well. So that the, uh, the our life actually was art practice is a traveling on its own. So uh, where you are come at, an, at a borderline of, 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 it is intentional, but it's very undefined in advance. And uh, um, now, anyway, I remember that uh, Hamish Fulton, to come back to, to, to him, uh, said once uh, on a question from um, uh, a person in the audience um, that participated to one of his slow walks, uh, what is an art walk? And, and he said, actually, a walk is an art piece uh, when the artist says it is so. <laughs> so when it is defined by the artist as an artwork, it is. And uh, secondly, he said the second uh, reason that a work of art, that a walk is a work of art, is that um, you walk in this uh, walk like you walk for the first time, uh, like you have walked never before in your life. And um, so these two elements, I think, are, are extremely important. Uh, that the the walk, let's say, the artist, the the, the art is there before the walk comes uh, because the artist is already an artist and whatever he does if it is walking or taking a pencil or uh, the like Matisse uh, cutting some um, shapes out of a paper immediately becomes art because it comes out of him and uh, he defines it as, as art and uh, and so um, it can have a very big uh, element of chance of randomness uh, which is uh, actually Creating possibilities. I think walking is about openness, creating possibilities. Uh, the the walking is is not consuming. It it's uh, leaving an end open. And um, so um, I see I'm walking on a very um, very positive utopic uh, way of um, creating art uh, because you don't define it. Um, you define it by doing it. And anyway, that was were some thoughts that came up. Okay, thank you, Geert. Uh, Robert, you you wish to say something? Yes. Uh, let's talk not so much about art, but let's talk about aesthetics. For example, take a painting, El Greco's view of Toledo. The way to appreciate El Greco is to walk in his persona, i.e., Toledo. And the best way to get into El Greco is to become him through walking through his physical world. It has to be physical. It's a matter of attunement. So attunement being the operative word. So, OK, that's interesting. Um, I'd like to bring Michael back because of the, you know, dealing with and what Babette was talking about, the history and the present. So this sort of attunement here, I think, sort of fits in on a sort of a slight angle here. Good. Yeah, yeah, I think there's been lots lots of interesting things sort of cropping up there. I, I think the idea of the sort of the spiritual of being in the zone that was that was quite um quite an in it was just quite interested in what people were discussing there. Um but the yeah the idea of attunement and uh, I guess re re reacting uh, sorry reenacting or or, or or reliving in, in some way. But I think this goes back because from from listening to the conversation there seems to be um, um, some people who if if you like uh, get in the zone um, spiritual if people choose that um, on their own and, and have the experience and and that is declared art in some way. And then there seems to be other people who have that experience and then maybe process it in a studio or in front of a laptop or something or a painting or drawing afterwards and, and try and sort of um, capture the, the event afterwards, if you like. Um, so, so the whole notion of walking, stumbling, being somewhere seems to be either um, acting or enacting uh, in a certain way, and I've been quite interested in um, the discussion about is it art or not. I think that that's something that certainly when I'm uh, doing doing residencies or, or even just going on my daily walk, um, 
you know, it crosses my mind. Am, am I making art or am I thinking about art? And I think that's quite a, um, a an interesting point to sort of um, push back to everyone about this idea of acting and enacting and, and capturing the enactment. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and it w w I'm just interested at which point um, everybody on the panel and everybody else who's sort of um, taken part sort of feels that the, the I guess, the processing or the, um, the philosophizing where it moves from the, the physical experience to, um, I, I guess, one might say the more commodified thing that, that can go in a gallery or um, you know, in my case at the moment, go on a website or, or be uploaded to Vimo, VMO or something like that. So, so I'm quite interested in, um, yeah, there's the historical and, and that kind of took me on to acting and enactment. And then and then I'm kind of um, p p uh, reflecting that back to the panel about where, where they feel this, this, this particular moment is occurring. Um, okay. Thank you, Michael. Alison, you popped your hand up and, and I guess when you were talking about whether there was such a thing as I think you were talking about at some point whether it was such a thing as walking art or or, or, or intentionality mm -hmm. you know the intention of the artist and then I was thinking well um, in terms of my PhD there was no intention by the women that I looked at to be walking artists or to you know they didn't say the walking in this work is intentional, um, but I guess as a as an as an artist who as an artist who invo whose work my myself as an artist who, whose work involves walking, um, uh, where was against on this? Um, uh, I have, during the PhD, also been an art historian. So I guess I've been an artist who has intentionally been used the method of being an art historian. And then when you talk about the, I don't know if this is pertinent, but in terms of the women artists who I looked at, I did actually retrace a couple of their walks. So I did actually walk across Dartmoor to Wisman Woods in order to retrace a piece of work by Nancy Holt called Trail Markers. So I kind of, I guess you could say it's sort of embodied experience, history, um, walking into somebody's work or mentally imagining walking into somebody's work. Of course, it's, it's never going to be the same piece of, you know, never going to be the same experience because she had an experience in September in 1969 and I had an experience in um, May 2015 so it was a very different experience um, sorry I'm, I'm really not sure where I'm going on this other than uh, That's fine. Well, Fiona just put a hand up obviously in response yeah. to what you were saying just then Fiona on you go yeah exactly I can totally relate to this moment when you you reflect on artists walking um, because it happened to me as well i was writing on my phd and i was doing all this research about hamish fulton's walks but also on other artists walks and i happened to be on on a small Greek island um one day and i remember that an intentional walk by Hamish would be to walk on the highest mountain of an island and walk back. And he also had some sunrise hikes he did. So all of a sudden I found myself deciding, okay, I get up in the morning, I hike up this mountain, I look at the sunrise and I hike down again. So it's what I did. And in the middle of the hike, um it got really cold and it was still dark and i didn't i just didn't seem to be reaching this top in in, in my life um and i was really swearing to myself loud outly um why i actually would 
go out there, put myself out there, um, not walk like an artist, but have this artist in mind and try to get in, get closer to the experience some of the artists ha might have had in mind when they did their intentional artworks. And then I, I did reach the top and I did see the sunrise and I did hike down, but the most important experience I had was not that I saw the sunrise, it was beautiful, but it was a sunrise, like you can have each day. It was the whole experience about putting myself out there in the dark, walking a path I didn't entirely walk before, um, and getting into the nature and getting this experience of um, going out a village, uh, leaving a village, and being in the nature, and it became my own experience in the context of art. That was something I really liked about it. It wasn't me as an artist. It wasn't an art piece. It was an art historian walking in the context of art. So I think this is, I really like uh, reflecting on that now. I really like this inter, inter, this mix of perspectives. And this I, was something came coming up to me when you talked, Alison. Michael. Yeah, yeah. I was just interested in some of the the, um, the points that um, Fiona was raising. Then it just kind of, it's it's a it's a bit of a clunky analogy, but when you stand in front of a painting, you kind of you you know it's argued that you're in the mind of the artist, so to speak. Um, and it's quite interesting some of the conversations about uh, uh, you know, is is the art walk. It, is the is the walking art is is the art walk and um but what what you seem to be discussing there is kind of almost the 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 experience of an artwork by by the walk um as if the walk is an artwork but it's not you creating art it's you that that, that you know that is that that's the equivalent if you like of being stood in front of the painting or the sculpture is is doing that walk and being in those footsteps i think that's quite um well, well that's why i went to dartmoor to walk across you know mm -hmm. to walk nancy holt's piece of work you know it was kind of a no you know that's absolutely why i did it um and to bring my experience of being a walker being a recreational walker being a hill walker into following in her footsteps as close as I could based on the sort of I don't know if any of you are familiar with the trail markers piece of work but the sort of 20 images um, of a rock a rock different rocks with the orange circle on on the um, on the rocks um, you know the, the the orange circle was painted on the rocks as a guide so she and Robert Smithson followed the walk via these rocks and she took photographs of them because I guess she was interested in the orange circle and what I wanted to investigate was how impactful was walking on the, on this particular production um, piece of work. Sorry to interrupt. To, no, no. To, I, 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 to dive yeah, in there. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but I know, I know um, you know, it's quite interesting that Holt's work is is quite gallery um, based, but but that you you've chosen to take that as a as kind of an index as to something that you you would do. Uh, I think I think that's I'm, I'm finding that quite interesting where this experience has gone, and I can see in the I'm gonna I'm gonna hand back to to, to Jez in a second, um, but I can see there's re recreational walk and and recreational intentional coming up in the, in, in the comments there, so it's it seems quite interesting that this idea of experiencing a uh, walking work of art through through actually doing the walk itself rather than going to the gallery and, and accessing it through that kind of um artifice if you want you know the, this kind of the, the remnants of the walk rather than doing the walk um, I'll, I'll hand it back to our chair to to um <laughs> yeah, thank you michael that, uh, uh, that that's another big question that you've asked there um, however, Fiona, you were waving your hand and needing to say something. Yes, uh, about what Michael said, the experience of an artwork. I think this is something which is of high interest of contemporary art, where um, the 
performance or the, the movement of the body is very important. And how do you explain to an art audience about this experience if they don't experience it themselves? So this is something I really like about contemporary art and also about walking art and walking encounters where you can participate because you get a sense of of that that feeling um you get more conscious about moving your body you got more you get more conscious about certain other things about the surroundings maybe even um towards the other participants and um it's it's kind of a i don't want to say it's a spiritual context but it's about the awareness um, we we would need to get closer to in interaction with other people and art and walking art especially can be a bridge in these conversations. Okay, okay, thanks, Fiona. So bridge uh, from bridge to Robert. Okay, I just wanted to make a point to Vivian, if I might, the point she raised. I'm with you, Vivian, in the use of artists. Ever since Malevich, it's become a redundant term. But I want to say what specifically, why specific meaning of spirituality is. When I use it, I use it in Kandinsky's definition of spirituality and concerning the spiritual art, which was in, in response to Voringer's abstraction and Einverlang, abstraction and empathy. So it's very specific use of it. So <coughs> I'll use it. Great. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank Thanks. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trevor, did you want to say well, you, we, your eyebrows were going up and down? I just thought you might need to. <laughs> One at a time. <laughs> um, just that thing about the participation being really sort of current. Um, I knew that 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 was out of all of the things that I was making from my walks. It was the walking with someone that was that I felt would most directly connect with for want of a better term a viewer um and i think that having I, we, i'm sure we've all been on um art events which have been walks that have been led by artists uh, some of us may even have led them but and this is not to I want to offend anyone but they all, i've been on a few and they always sort of leave me cold and i think the reason for that is that it's it becomes a sort of guided tour um or, well, a guided tour. Uh, I've been on another one which was sort of half comedy stand-up routine, but on a walk by an artist. And although it was a great time, I didn't leave feeling that I'd experienced art in any way. Um, so I think that that's what made me um, lean towards doing it with just one person at a time. I love the idea of, well, it made me think about what Michael said about standing in front of a, a painting and you, it's just you and the painting and you're trying to get into the, the, not necessarily the mind of the artist, but maybe the attitude of the artist or whatever he was feeling. And I think that that also comes back to what Robert was saying about the ego as well, which is that part part of my walk, there was, a, there was a time a few months in when I was doing it where I was thinking, actually, is it me that's the work here? And is, is it me that I'm that I'm giving to people and letting them experience? Um, but I quickly dismissed that because it just feels like a bit, you know, that's very ego driven. And, and it's not really about experiencing me. It's about me allowing you to um, to experience the walk, really, um, and, and pretty much on your terms. But, um, yeah, I'm sort of losing the thread a bit there. But I just think that participation thing is really important. And that's why, um, <laughs> although I enjoy going for walks on my own and will continue to do so, um, it's much more interesting. I find it much more interesting to be with someone, probably okay. because um, the conversation is just so much better. <laughs> no, but the... <laughs> you have to get practiced. Maybe, maybe you just haven't practiced talking to yourself enough. <laughs> ah, well, there is there is a lot of that, I have to say. Uh, no, but I think but that. I um, think... Sorry, go on. Just... I think I could probably do what I do with walks with other artists in another setting. Um, it could be, well, you have to be side by side, I think, but, it, but yeah. you know, it could be drives with other artists, it could be train journeys, um, mm. anything like, you know, where you're, where you're traveling, because that seems to feed 
conversation conversation um it just so happens that walking was my thing so it's not the walking that's it's the conversation that's really the the thing and it just happens that i've come to it through walking i think the thing that i've hit on is that people want to talk about themselves mm. and they and they want to offload or they want to share their ideas they want feedback and that's really what happens on on the big walks that i do the the, the big long walks anyway mm. you know well thank you yes alan hi and david alan first of all hi there yeah just um just myself i walked uh not well not as an artist as a technologist uh although if you look at the origins of the two words the distinction is zero in the history yeah, yeah, in history, um, yeah. but around wales some years ago and on stumbling there's lot, loads of stumbling upon uh stumbling upon art stumbling upon people that's it. but there's also stumbling mm. and one of the times particularly one time i remember falling head over heels instantly recording something because I knew people would be looking at some of the data I was recording and the, the, the record was absolutely crucial and I think that's something will be recognized by lots of people here um, but realizing that the reason that I'd stumbled and had fallen was because my blood sugar and my hydration was low and I'd mm. and as a in day-to-day -day life I eat meals at fixed times and I don't wasn't aware of my body and the walking the becoming aware of one's body and had to learn when I was hungry which I didn't know normally I had to learn when I needed to drink and I was wondering I mean particularly I think this would be Alison would be but I mean others as well um, might you know that that finding your physical body as well mm -hmm. as the sort of conceptual one others whether there's experience that that's a very good point Alison, you and I have talked about this, so. I was made redundant on the 31st of March 2010, and I decided that I would go out for a walk. It, became, it was really important that I went out for a walk on the 1st of April. And I went on a fairly um, easy uh, route from Hayfield um, up, onto Kinder De onto Kinder, up to Kinder Plateau. Um, and when I set off, it was um, it was sunny, and I had my map kit and everything with me. And I was um, I basically I fell in the stream um, as I was on my way up. So I fell in the stream, the map fell in the stream, and I had to decide whether I was going to carry on or not. And um, basically, I kind of um did carry on um but i think i probably fell because i wasn't wasn't aware of my body i wasn't um i was feeling incredibly anxious that i could um do this walk it was there was a lot riding on this particular walk even though it was kind of a relatively easy nine mile walk up onto kinder plateau um and then when I got up to the top, I fi did finally dry out. Um, but then I got caught in a, a in an almost whiteout, so I couldn't actually see very well in, in snow. Basically, when I got to the top, there was snow, and also the snow was cover covering the uh, the footpaths. So I was kind of somewhat confused and wasn't quite sure where I was on the map. I was never actually entirely um, lost. Uh, um, sorry, I'm, I, I was supposed to be talking about another one. I've just read. <laughs> it's okay. The <it's> slides. <laughs> um, I just remembered what what the one the one that I was going to speak about, um, which is one. And uh, sorry. What I realized on both that walk in the Peak District and another one in Dar on Dartmoor was that I was so involved in walking and following a, a, a compass bearing that I forgot to eat. And because I forgot to eat, my concentration dropped, my blood sugar dropped. And in particular on Dartmoor, uh, what happened to me was 
I did finally get myself to the place I wanted to do um, called Green Hill. And I took some photographs because I tend to take photographs once I've got to a particular site rather than actually on the, on the, as I'm walking. But I tend to photograph the kind of different points along the map. Um, and I'm completely out of focus in the, in the images. Um, and so when I first looked at them, I thought, well, these are completely terrible photographs, uh, really incompetent photographs. But then, of course, you know, six months later, I looked back at them and thought, well, no, actually, because I'm out of focus, it was totally, you know, I, I was hungry. I should have eaten. I wasn't concentrating. I was out. out um, yeah, exactly what you're describing there, Alan. You know, I was um, so much in my head. I wasn't thinking about my body. Now, subsequently, I've been on walks with others who've pointed out to me, Alison, you've stopped concentrating. You need to eat. So clearly, I'm not very. <laughs> I think that's what you were referring to, Je Jeremy. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm not noticing the time and I think probably, you know, we should um, all go and have something to eat or something to drink soon. Mm -hmm. I have a one more quick question. Oh, okay. Um, it has another question. We could be here all it's, night. It's, it's, uh, it's short. Um, it's for Trevor uh, and somebody else mentioned it as well. I'm not British and uh, I live. I don't even live in Europe. Um, so I'm not sure what the route or route is that you mentioned. I first heard it as Appian Way, but I know that you're not in uh, close to Rome. Uh, so now I'm thinking <laughs> it's Penning, but I'm I I don't know. So what is it? Uh, it's the Pennine Way, which is the P E W N I N E, and um, it was Thanks. it was designed as a as a British answer to the Appalachian Trail up the east coast of America. Uh, I think in the twenties, but it didn't become a national trail officially until I think possibly the fifties. Um, anyway, yeah, it's it's essentially across the sort of high point that runs up the centre of the landmass of mainland Britain. Um, it starts in the Peak District, which is the 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 walk that Alison just described, where she um, was with snow on the top up on Kinder Scout, is actually the start point of the or five miles from the start point of that walk. And it takes you up through several national parks and then across, almost across to the Lake District, which is uh, beautiful. <laughs> and then and, and, and it takes you up into sort of remote Northumbrian landscape. And it's all high, high um, altitudes. Well, not in terms of the rest of the world, but in, the, in British terms it is. Um, so it's across moorland, open moorland, uh, various hills. And you might call them mountains or you may not. And it ends in the <laughs> Scottish border. Well, I think the average time is about 14, 15 days. I took 17, and I recommend it. It, it, follow, it follows the watershed, basically, Babek, and the, yeah. the, the backbone yes. of, of England. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That, mm -hmm. Fiona, over to you now. Well, I can just say thank you so much for giving insight to your artistic reflections on walking and walking art. And it brings me to the, well, to my research actually, because the experience is so individual, the experience of walking and, and your walking you have talked about is so much individual experience and the individual and personal interest. So this is, for me, it's part of the whole art and artistic practice. And I cannot divide it from this is walking. No, it's, it's merged together. And I think this is, again, of high interest for me and the research I'm doing at university. And it was a pleasure talking to you and hearing more about that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, David's got something. David, you just waving or? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying something. I think, I think Alison sort of summed it up with her, her pictures in the beginning with the cord, and that it's like an out of body experience because she's. It's not like a selfie with our mobile phone. She's creating her own out-of-body experience with, okay, and 
those lovely photographs with the with the red cloth in the wind it was lovely um mm -hmm. and i and i just think i think i think we're all doing that i think everyone's mm -hmm. doing that mm -hmm. yeah good point alison would you like to say sort of a final thing perhaps in response to david and uh, that high praise there for for your beautiful photographs it's that I was thinking earlier, perhaps I'm a bit of an old fashioned. Thank you, Thank you will do. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I was about to undo undo what you've said. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but you were going on to say, Alison, about something. Um, well, yes, definitely. Thank you, because aesthetics and the mood, you know, there's, there's kind of feelings of weather or um, I don't know whether it's an outer body, you know, that that experience is the kind of thing I was trying to get across. Yeah. Okay. Um, and sometimes the more, the, the worse the the weather. Because actually, the the red cloth, there are sort of westerlies coming at me at a sort of ninety, you know, like across um, an area of moorland. Uh, it was it was actually quite difficult. It, it was almost like the difficulty of taking the photograph was incredibly enjoyable. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Michael B. Hi. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you everyone it was all all really interesting um i think on a just on a personal um sort of level because of the work i'm doing at the moment this idea of um acting and reenacting got really 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 interesting for me in in terms of um uh, processing historical events and uh, should they be reenacted or is it okay to reenact in certain ways um and, and and how you sort of um how you tackle that and, and make it something in the contemporary mind. So yeah, um, yeah. Thanks very much. And and a lot of it just interesting because it was genuinely interesting, even though it didn't directly relate to um, my own personal sort of research interests. So thanks very much. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, Trevor. Yeah, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm eternally grateful to you for uh, inviting me to take part. Um, I did have um, a walk scheduled with Alison, I think probably about a year ago, but my MA sort of took over and quite a lot of them got sidelined while that was finished. But Alison, I hope we can get together and go for that walk uh, somewhere in your neck of the woods. And Michael is from pretty much about, born about three miles away from where I was born. So I yeah, think uh, we're probably going to. Northern boys. Yeah, yeah. yeah and um, I would just like to extend the invitation to anyone else that feels feels like a walk, then my email address is on the group email. Uh, get in touch, and we'll try and arrange something. I was just going to say, I was I was having a, a, a slightly philosophical, conceptual um, notion talking about the Pennine Way because I'm currently in Stockport, so quite near Kinder Scout, um, and, it end, and it ends in Northumberland, and I'm I'm a border reaver, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Conceptually, I'm where I am, sat in front of this uh, laptop, and and where the pan and where it ends have this this interesting um, link um, <laughs> mediated through an online discussion with people from all over the world. So yeah, quite an, quite quite an uncanny occurrence. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody: Alison, Trevor, Fiona, Michael, Babek, Kiet, Robert, Vivian. Alan, David, Bridget, Darren, Joan, and everybody else who came 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 to the meeting. Um, I hope that you you can take away something from it. Uh, I certainly can. And thank you especially to the Walk, Listen, Create folks, who uh, Andrew <laughs> as well, um, who are pretty superb people really, and are working very hard at making this thing happen. Um, so we should try to support them. And I suppose really what we can take away, well, what I'm going to take away from this all together this evening is that, you know, if you stumble, you may fall. And that's okay. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See you again sometime. Thanks, Cheerio. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.